Hi everybody, it's Kip from SDI, going over your evolution of firearms and your introduction to firearms handbook. Firearms have come a long way since the 1500s. And in this time we're going to talk, this brief overview, you're going to find out just a little bit about history and how it's changed, and actually some things you may not have known. For instance, in the 1500s, they actually started with the old Snapfoos smoothbore. The old Snapfoos rifle in the 15th century was actually a pretty cool gun. It had a matchlock system. The only downside of the matchlock system was you had a small little fire hole, and as it came forward and hit your pan, it was either used by a match, and usually it was used by a piece of cord that was burning. It's the bad side of that, if you're in rain, no fire, no, so it wouldn't work. But soon after that, that's when they came out with the wheel lock, and also shortly after that, the flint lock. The wheel lock was a pretty cool apparatus in the way it worked. You had this clock mechanism, basically, is what they made it out of. You would take your tool, and you would one quarter turn, pull your hammer back, and as it came forward, you had a piece of pyrite, not flint, but pyrite, would strike and would fire. That was very cumbersome though, and it took two hands, and it really wasn't real popular. So really shortly after that was not too long, we saw the, the flintlock. Now the flintlock, as you know, was really reliable. All you needed was a sharp piece of flint, put your powder prime in there, have your gun already capped with your primer and your ball. When it came forward and struck, would make a streak down like this, would cause the big spark, and fire. That firearm was reliable for close to 100 years, and even up into the 1775, even though there were some new designs out there, and even rifling, the British still used it in the old brown best. That was a really, really good design and worked for many years. And you still saw it even in the later, as the 1800s started to come around, a lot of the old mountain men, Indians. Next came into the 1800s. In the 1800s, we had a new design especially right around the time of the Civil War. At that time, we came out with the percussion cap, or it was known as the snap cap. And it works by simply this. Your modern percussion cap, as you know, it was basically the same thing. They would put the cap onto the nipple, would come forward, strike, go into the trough, create the fire, and the projectile would fly. That was used up through the Civil War. At the same time, that they had this for the rifle. There was a man named Samuel Colt who came along and adapted that to the pistol. And that was our first modern revolver that we saw, the Army revolver. Mr. Colt was very ingenious in his design and it allowed mainly your officers and cavalrymen more adaptability to be able to reload quicker and have more shots. Subsequently, Many of your cavalrymen, your officers, and those who have these pistols would already have loaded cylinders that they kept on their belts so they could do quick changes as well, which gave them a lot more speed both on their horses and the battlefield and saved a lot of time in the reloading process. At the same time though, during this 1858 span, a lot of people don't know that there was another gun maker out there who actually invented the double action revolver. That was kind of new, and it had no hammer on it, and it really wasn't popular with a lot of people. They were weary of it because they were used to their cocking their hammers. So at this time, you can see where technology was really starting to boom, and these rifle makers and these gun makers that were in America, basically these gunsmiths, a lot of them from Germany, they were already building carbines and long rifles with rifling in it, and that was mainly the Kentucky rifle. And that's what we're familiar with the seeing on TV and Civil War movies. You see the old powder horns, you see that kind of thing. But what also was available at that time was the modern cartridge. During the 1860s period, we also saw the Sharps rifle, we saw the Spencer, and we saw several private gun makers who were making their own versions of these type of weapons. One being the Henry Yellow Boy. Now, the military was a little shy to bring those forth, and one reason why was cost. As you know, the North had a lot of money, the South did not have a lot of money, so the Southerners pretty much were using whatever they could get their hands on. There was even some old flintlocks used in that war. Mainly it was the infield. 
And of course, the issue at the time for the North was the Springfield. But there were some regiments of Union soldiers that did actually have these repeaters. From there, we started blossoming into the late 1800s. By the late 1800s, we started seeing all kinds of things coming forth. For instance, going back in time, in the 18, late 1850s, there was a young man by the name of Mauser, who was actually an apprentice with Remington. And he designed the first bolt-action rifle. That rifle had a lot of problems, and it didn't go very far. But in 1898, he and his brother, they released the 1898 Mauser. That set the precedence for our modern day bolt action. In fact, even today, we still see many, many rifles that are adapted and built upon that action. So with that history right there, it, we go into the 1900s, and we also run into another genius by the name of John Moses Browning. Now we all know John Browning has had many, many, many designs. In fact, in 1900, he introduced his first semi-automatic pistol. Colt, as you know, worked with Browning, and Browning worked with Colt. That very first one was an F and N. But everybody started coming out with them. There was the pocket vest guns, and eventually as we got toward the World War II period, we ended up with the 1911. We know the history status of that. But along with that, revolvers kept coming as well, and the double action revolver got better and better from Colt's to Smith & Wesson's to Ivor Johnson's, to, to many other makers that were out there. So as you can see, there was a huge boom in the industrialization of firearms. Now, not to, not to pass history up, we have all seen the old westerns, and we also know about the single action revolver that was called the Peacemaker, but that was actually eventually designed for military use. And some of it actually saw some use on San Juan Hill with Teddy Roosevelt. From there, we have seen the evolution of the Winchester's lever actions, the 94s that we have today, all basically the same design. We had lever action shotguns that worked pretty much the same as the lever action rifle. Now shotguns, let's talk about those for a little bit, their history. We've already mentioned it a little bit, but royalty, kings, wealthy men, they would go to the fields and they hunted with falcons. Falcons was how they hunted birds and fowl back then. Well, if it rained or if it was bad weather or the bird just didn't want to cooperate, they wouldn't work. And one day in the field, a guy got an idea who had his rifle with him that he saw a bird and he shot and he hit it. And they thought that was really something. Well, you can imagine that was a lucky shot. And afterwards, it didn't work too well. So they got the idea. What if we took little lead pieces and put inside this thing, and then shoot it from there, and thus the shotgun was born. Now they called it fouling, and fouling guns. But as time went by, it got better, and it was so popular that they started perfecting. And they actually started making double barrel um, oct octobuses just for hunting birds. Well, when the Mayflower got here, and the pilgrims came, by then they had another weapon that was designed, it was called the blunderbuss. Now that blunderbuss really was a shotgun. You could pack about anything in that thing and it would shoot. <laughs> and it really was for like solid projectile and lead pieces is what they really designed it for. In the time period of Winchester designing his lever actions, we saw the first lever action shotgun. And that lever action shotgun actually became the pump shotgun. And if you look at your history and there's some out there, it's really cool how it worked. That gun, of course, once the pump came out, was obsolete. But you can still see them today being used by cowboy action shooters. If they can find them, they get them. From there, it graduated in to the semi-automatic shotgun. In addition to the other shotguns that evolved, before all these modern shotguns came around, that even as early in the 1500s, they had de designed a breech system. Mostly like we see with the single shot shotgun and the double barrel shotguns. Those guns have not changed much in all these years. 
They had the cocking hammers on them. We still see rabbit ears. In the Old West, that's what you probably see. Now we have cocking systems that once you breach it, it closes, pushes two pins, sets the hammers, and we shoot. But other than that, the designs are still the same. So when you look at those old double barrels, you look at those single shots, think of it way back when. Because it all started back in those old days, and they haven't changed much in all of these years. And these old shotgun designs actually have led to the things we see now, the Benelli inertia system that you see now, the Sega automatic. <laughs> There's all kinds of cool things out there that they may not have realized was going to happen. Going back to John Browning, he designed one of the best there ever was, and that was the A5 Browning. But John Browning, he wasn't happy with that, and he designed even more, as you know. By World War I, we saw his machine guns being used in wars. And even today, the old Model Deuce 50, still around, the M60s, all these different guns that were Browning designs are still around. And our modern firearms that we see today, they still work with some of the same principles. Now, there's a lot of, been, a lot of technology that's come forth and changed things and moved things around, but it's still the same basic principles on how they work. So my whole point with this and the history thing is to study your history of firearms. It's not only a great thing to learn, but you see how important gunsmiths were to the industrialization and the evolution of firearms. And we're going through a whole new generation of gunsmiths and tradesmen. And as technology gets better and better, there's going to be some new designs coming out. And that could be you. So I encourage you, go back and study your history. There's so much more than what we could have even scratched the surface here with today. But again, I reiterate, the next John Browning could be you. Until then, on behalf of me and SDI, this is Kip Carpenter wishing you all the best in your gunsmithing endeavors.